for coming at yeah and for coming at the uh, this time, which is unusual for the seminar. Um, yeah, so um, so um, the starting point of what I want to talk about today is Ramsey's theorem, which probably many of you have heard about. But just in case not everyone um, has heard about it, let me remind you what it says. So roughly speaking, Ramsey's theorem says that in every large graph, um, you must uh, be able to um, you will always be able to find a large vertex subset U, so that within the subset U either um, you have edges everywhere, so any two vertices in U are connected by an edge, or there are no edges at all in U. So the subset U is either complete, so it has all possible edges between vertices in U, or no edges at all. So now obviously this statement is a little bit imprecise because I said large here and large there. And um, okay, so let's make the statement a little bit more precise. So more precisely, Ramsey's theorem can be stated as if n is sufficiently large with respect to k, then in any graph on n vertices, you can always find a set u of k vertices so that either every pair of vertices in u is connected by an edge or there's, there are no edges at all in u. So no pair of vertices in u is connected by an edge. Okay, so here's a picture um, just to, I don't know, illustrate this. Um, so here is uh, some, so here n is six, so here there's some graph on six vertices here. And the point is, whatever graph you want to take on six vertices, you'll always be able to find three vertices which form a triangle, so uh, and a three vertices with pairwise edges in between. Or, well, if that's not possible, so there's some graphs where this, that's not possible, like this one, then, so if that's not possible, then you'll at least be able to find three vertices with no edges at all. So in, for every graph on six vertices, whatever graph you want to draw, you always find three vertices, which either are triangles or all connected by edges or have no edges in between at all between these three vertices. Okay, so that's Ramsey's theorem. And so because this is a little, little clumsy to write like this, uh, we, um, there are some names for these two cases. So the first case, is, is, uh, we say that these, um, these K vertices in U form a clique. And in the second case, we say that from an independent set. Okay, so in a, so um, so in other words, here is just these definitions I just said. So a subset where any two vertices are connected by an edge is called a clique. A subset where there are no edges at all is called an independent set. And so now we can restate Ramsey's theorem from the last slide as saying that if n is sufficiently large with respect to k, then in any graph on k vertices and n vertices, you can always find a clique or an independent set of size at least k. Okay. So, um, so that's a theorem which probably many of you have heard about at some point. Um, but basically, the question is now: This theorem just tells you that this is true if n is sufficiently large. But well, how large does n actually need to be with respect to k? So, in other words, uh, an equivalent way to ask the same question is to ask: If you are given some n, how large can we make with k? So, in other words, how large of a clique or independent set are we actually able to find? Okay, so for example, but, um, the pictures on the last slide were supposed to illustrate that if n is six, we can always find, so if we have six vertices, we are always able to find a clique or independent set of size at least three. Um, and that's best possible, so it's easy to construct examples where you can't find a clique or independent set of size at least four. So basically, if n is six, the answer to this question is the clique with three is the best possible. But in general, this question is still open. And it's actually one of the most fundamental problems in extremely combinatorics to understand this dependence here better. Okay, so here is what's known about this. So um, Erdős and Sekerős proved with an inductive argument, which is um, which many of you may also have seen, and uh, because it's that part of say maybe a standard combinatorics uh, class or something, as uh, some kind of basically some relatively easy inductive argument. Um, can be used and was used by Erdős and Sekeres in 1935, so quite a long time ago, that it's possible to take k equals a half log 2n. So basically what they showed is that every n vertex graph always does contain a clique or an independent set of at least this size, so at least a half log, log, log 2n. Um, so in other words, that gives us a lower bound on the best possible k from the statement on the last slide. This best possible k is gonna be at least this number. Okay. And so this bound is actually up to, up to this constant factor of half. This bound is actually best possible, so up to the constant factor here. Um, namely, Erdős proved around 10 years later an upper bound, where he proved that the, he proved basically this logarithmic behavior is correct. So he proved that um, if n is at least three, then there exist n vertex graphs with no clique or independent set of size at least two log two n. 
Okay, so basically that gives us an upper bound for the K on the last slide. So basically the best possible K we can choose um, <clears throat> must be at most two log two N. So there exists N vertex graphs where we can't find a clique or independent set larger than two log two N. Okay, and, um, but as you see, there's still a gap between this, this bound of a half log two N here and the bound of two log two N here. And so closing this gap between these constants a half and two remains a fundamental open problem. And I guess, as I said on the previous slide, it's uh, maybe one of the most important open questions in extreme combinatorics. And so you see these results are quite old. And so over the past 70 years, a lot of people have worked on the problem of trying to fi figure out what the correct behavior is, what the correct constant is here. But despite of a lot of work, um, there has been no progress on closing the gap between these constant factors here. I mean, between these, these coefficients here. So there's been some improvements to lower order terms, but, um, but say the half and the two, the kind of factor in front of the main logarithmic term has been unchanged over the past 70 years. Okay, so here's again, um, this, uh, um, this bound of Erdős. So he showed that, um, so he showed an upper bound on this set, so sort of K in Ramsey's theorem, or in other words, he showed that for at least for every n at least three, there exist n vertex graphs for which there is no clique or independent set of size at least two log two n. And so he proved this result with a probabilistic method. So that means he showed that a random graph on n vertices typically has no clique or independent set of at least the size. And because that's true for a random graph, there must be examples of such graphs. Um, but actually finding an explicit example of such a graph without such a clique or independent set of the size is still um, an open problem. So Anders' proof by considering this random graph is, um, it, it shows the statement, but doesn't give an ex explicit construction of such graphs. And um, so still up to now, there are no explicit constructions of such graphs known. And even if you make the problem easier, no explicit constructions are known. So even if you don't necessarily care about this too so much, so even if you allow yourself to put a different constant factor here, so another constant C bigger than two, then no explicit constructions are known. So again, the random graph will still have that property if you put a different constant C, if the constant C is bigger than two. But even then, making the problem easier that way by putting, say, a million here or any other fixed number, no explicit constructions are known. For large n. Okay, and so that leads to the notion of a C Ramsey graph, which is basically precisely what we get from, from, from that question. So what we get from putting a different constant C here instead of a two. So for a fixed C, we say that an N vertex graph is called a C Ramsey graph if it doesn't contain a clique or an independent set of size at least C log two N. So the, the um, intuition between this definition is that C Ramsey graphs for any fixed C are graphs which have basically near optimal behavior with respect to Ramsey's theorem. So they're graphs which don't have very large cliques or independent sets. And so where the boundary for very, or the threshold for the very large is this C log to N. And so as we know, this log to N is kind of the optimal behavior in Ramsey's theorem. And so if they up to relaxing this to up to this constant factor C, uh, which you can think of as 10 or 100 or something like that, then um, if, if then this the graph satisfies this, pro um, this property of not having a large clique or independent set, then it's called a C Ramsey graph. Okay, and so as I already said on the last slide is that there are no explicit constructions known for C Ramsey graphs for any fixed C and large N. So we know they exist and we know that most graphs have this property because a random graph has this property with high probability of C is at least two but um, no explicit constructions are known. And um, the, a lot of people care about this problem of finding explicit constructions. And it's ex this problem of finding these explicit constructions is actually also closely related to the topic of randomness and extraction and theoretical computer science. And so, um, so, that, that's, um, so in that community, a lot of people also work on this problem. And actually the best say, the best known constructions actually come from this random extraction connection. 
Okay, so um, so maybe a natural question is now, why is it so difficult to find explicit constructors for this? And well, I don't think there's a kind of precise answer to the question, but maybe a heuristic, why, why it's uh, maybe, um, maybe, I mean, one possible reason why it's so difficult is that it's believed that the C. Ramsey graphs must in some sense be random-like. So they must behave like a random graph. And if it has, I mean, if they have to have this sort of random-like behavior, that would maybe be one possible explanation why it's so hard to construct them explicitly. Um, okay, but now of course, be random like is not a very precise thing. So um, in order to, um, but, but, but one can make some more precise statements of the form that C. Ramsey graphs must have various properties which are common for random graphs. So basically it's believed that they must behave like random graphs with respect to various properties. Um, so here's uh, one such property. So um, Erdos and Semeredi proved already a long time ago, so the CRMZ graphs were studied for quite a while. Um, so they proved that for any fixed C, um, uh, the edge density of large CRMZ graphs is bounded away from zero and one. So what that means is that uh, for every fixed C, there exists some epsilon so that um, if N is sufficiently large, then every CRMZ graph that N vertices must have edge density, at least epsilon and at most one minus epsilon. So, so that in itself is maybe not such a strong property because it just tells you something about the number of edges of this C Ramsey graph, right? It just tells you it doesn't have too many edges and not um, too few. Um, but um, you can actually, if you know this result, you can also apply this to new subgraphs of C Ramsey graphs. So you, if you look at any subset of n to the of at least n to the alpha f vertices for any fixed alpha, so think of alpha b 0.1. So um, you look at any subgraph consisting at, of at least n n to the 0.1 vertices, um, then the induced subgraph on those vertices, so the part of the graph on those vertices, um, will again be a um, a Ramsey graph for a slightly different uh, constant C, namely basically 10 C. Um, and so then in that kind of new subgraph, you can apply this statement of addition similarity as a black box. And that way you'll find that again, in that new subgraph, you have edge density bounded away from zero and so on. And so basically this actually now tells you something rather strong about the edge distribution in this graph. So it, what it tells you is, you, you have this kind of n vertex graph, the C Ramsey graph on n vertices. And now if you look at any subset of, uh, of vertices, which is not too small, so any subset of vertices, which has size at least n to the 0 0.1, then you know in that subset, the edge density is bounded away from zero and one. And so, so basically that is now tells you something rather strong about the edge distribution. And so random graphs also have these properties. So that's one way in which Ramsey graphs are uh, random like. Okay, but um, other, um, so that's not the only statement of that flavor that's been proved. So together with, or proved or conjectured. So with, together with various collaborators, Adish actually made a whole series of conjectures on the diversity of C. Ramsey gra uh, graphs with respect to um, induced subgraphs or with respect to vertex subsets. So Adish made a whole series of conjectures on kind of the theme of say how that the vertex subsets um, uh, must induce a rather diverse range of induced subgraphs in this event. Okay, so just to give an example of one of these conjectures. Um, so one of these conjectures that Erdos made and which was proved by Scheller in 1998 um, stated that every C Ramsey graphs on G, um, C, every C Ramsey graph on N vertices contains at least exponentially in many N different induced subgraphs. So it contains at least two to the delta C N different vertex subsets inducing non-isomorphic subgraphs where delta C is a constant, positive constant only depending on C. So basically we have exponentially many different induced subgraphs, non different non-isomorphic induced subgraphs which appear in your CRMZ graph. Um, and so there was this whole series of different conjectures that I just made with different co-authors on this diversity, on this theme of diversity of induced subgraphs in the CRMZ graphs. And um, many of them got resolved, but one of them remained open until very recently, and that was a conjecture of Erdős and McKay. And so here's the statement of that conjecture. So that conjecture stated that um, for, for every fixed C, um, there is some delta C so that the following holds. Namely, if you have a C Ramsey graph on N vertices, 
um, and some integer x between zero and which is not too, uh, which is not negative, but not too big. So it's at most less as the n squared. Then you can find a vertex subset of G containing exactly X edges. So in other words, you find an induced subgraph of G with exactly X edges. So here's again the statement. So you have a C Ramsey graph, and now you have any X in this range. So any X, which is not negative, but not too big. So at most this quadratic bound in N then you will always be able to find some vertex subset of your, uh, of your graph G, which has exactly X edges. So basically for every target value X, you can achieve the target value as an edge count of an induced subgraph. And so um, Erdős seemed to like this conjecture um, a lot because he actually included in several collections of his paper problems, and he also offered a $100 reward for it. Okay, so here's again the conjecture. So it says that for every fixed C, there's some delta C so that the statement holds. And the statement is that within any C UMZ graphs on N vertices, um, you can find for any prescribed number X within these bounds, you can find vertex subset in the C -RAMZ, given, given C UMZ graphs, which has exactly X edges. Okay, so here's a picture because maybe the statement is a bit convoluted. So you have some C and you have some C Ramsey graph on N vertices. So in this picture, this is our C Ramsey graph G. So someone gives you a C Ramsey graph G and I mean, some graph G and um, the graph has the property that C Ramsey. So in other words, it doesn't have very large cliques or independent sets. Okay, so now that person also gives you a value of X. And so in our example, X is gonna be two, but in general, X can be anything between these bounds. And so now your task is to find a vertex subset of G containing exactly X edges. And so in this case, this is pretty easy. You can find this vertex subset U here, which now contains exactly these two edges. Or in other words, you find, I mean, if you look at the induced subgraph on this vertex set U, it has exactly two edges. In this case, that's easy. And maybe in any particular small example that you wanna draw on a piece of paper, it's not gonna be so hard, but in general, it's actually not so, not so easy to find, I mean, it's not clear how, I mean, how you would prove this in general that you can always find such a U. Because basically the point is as you kind of, maybe you start with one vertex at another one, at another one. And as you add vertices to your set U, you get more and more edges. But with every new vertex you add, the number of edges is gonna jump, right? So you can't add edges one by one. So typically if you already have say half of the vertices or something in your subset and you add another one, your number of edges is gonna increase by something on the order of N. And so attaining exactly this X is actually pretty difficult because you might jump right over it and then you need to take something out, but then you go right back, I mean, go very much back and somehow you need to adjust and it's not clear how you would achieve exactly this number X in general. So that's basically why this contact, I mean, I'm just trying to give you some feeling for why this is actually not trivial or why this is difficult. Um, okay, so maybe um, to also make one comment about this threshold here. So why is this a reasonable threshold for X here? So right, I mean, X should certainly be non-negative if we want to find a vertex subset containing exactly X edges. This doesn't make any sense if X is negative, so X should be at least zero. But why is this threshold for X? Why does that make sense? Well, so we know that, um, so the, I mean, certainly if we, if we want to be able to find a vertex subset of G which contains exactly X edges, we need that the graph G in total has at least X edges. Um, so certainly this statement can only, has only any chance of folding if X uh, is at most the number of edges of G. And so we know by, a, um, so now kind of, a priori, it's maybe not clear why you could then hope for quadratic for X to go up to this quadratic threshold. But actually, let me let me mention again there was this result of Erdogan similarity, which I uh, mentioned a few slides ago, which tells us that the edge density of this graph G is bounded away by zero and one. So, in other words, it tells us that this graph G has at least delta C prime times n squared edges for some uh, constant delta C prime, which is positive and only depends on C. So that means we have at least a quadratic number of edges in our graph in total. So that means that it's not, I mean, otherwise uh, there would be no hope, uh, no way to hope for X to go up to some sort of quadratic bound. But indeed uh, we have a quadratic number of edges at our disposal. And so that's not a contradiction to hope for that. Okay, so, um, so the theorem, uh, first theorem I wanna talk about today 
is that this conjecture is true. So that's, um, oh yeah, I forgot to mention my co-authors on the first slide. So everything I'm talking about today is joint work with Matthew Kwan, um, Ashwin Sa, and Metab Sony. Um, and so in particular, um, this, this result that the Elish McKay conjecture is true is joint work with them and everything else in this talk too. Okay, um, maybe let me pause for a second. Are there any questions? Everyone has their cameras up, so it's a bit hard to um, see whether anyone is still following. Did you get a hundred dollars? Um, so uh, not uh, not yet. So the um, apparently, in order to get the money, the paper has to be accepted to a journal, and it just came out as a preprint um, last month. So um, so um, I guess it will take some while, a while until so the refereeing process and so on. But uh, then hopefully we get a hundred dollars if there's still money left. Apparently there, I mean, there are still people who um, who take care of Erdish's money and give it out and people solve Erdish problems. I don't know um, whether there's still money left though, but from what I heard, it sounded like probably there was. Any other questions? You're doing fine. Okay. I mute my microphone because there's airplanes outside. I see. Okay. Okay, great. So then let me tell you some more about our results. So here's again this conjecture of Erdős McKay. And so our first result um, that we proved is that this conjecture is true. And so uh, for historic, I mean, for historical reasons, let me also mention some previous progress. So it was previously shown that this conjecture is true if G is a random graph. So that was proved already a while ago in 1992. Um, and it was also proved to a certain range of axes namely some sort of smaller range starting at zero. So Alon Kivilevich and Sudakov proved that, um, that the conjecture is true if X is up to N to the alpha C for some small constant alpha C bigger than zero. So for some alpha C, which depends on C, but is always positive, um, Alon Kivilevich and Sudakov proved this conjecture um, if X is up to N to the alpha C. So that means they proved some sort of very small starting range here. But note that this n to the alpha c is much, much, much smaller than n squared. So basically, they proved sort of that the conjecture is true for some small initial interval of axis. And then, relatively recently, Kwan and Sudakov proved um, that uh, you can achieve at least a quadratic number of different values x here. So basically, um, what, what this conjecture says is that you can achieve every single number x in this quadratic length interval starting at zero. And so what they proved is that there's at least a quadratic number of different x's that you can achieve, but not necessarily everything in this interval. I want to ask a question. What's listed is previous pro progress about a true if g of is a random graph, but the conjecture states for every graph. So how for do you- every, For every C Ramsey graph. That's what the conjecture states. Right, so yeah. this thing that Kalk and Fries and McKay did in 1992, yeah. what's, what's the precise statement of what they did in 92? So the precise statement is if you take a random graph, then with high probability, oh, okay. it satisfies the property that for every integer x, blah, blah, blah. Works. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and so, be, um, yeah, so, so this is kind of, progress towards this in the sense that if G is a random graph, then with high probability, it is a C-Ramsey graph, right? So if you hope for the conjecture to be true, then you better, well, then you better also hope that, that it's true. I mean, that this kind of high probability statement is true for random graphs, but the high probability statement for random graphs is easier, right? Because a random graph is very well behaved with respect to um, a lot of things. And uh, it's kind of, I guess everything is random. And so, I mean, yeah, so, so, so the statement for random graphs is easier than the conjecture because yeah, thank it's a monastic statement for every theoretic. I understand your answer, thank you. Okay, so um, here's again our theorem proving the conjecture. So this is basically a restatement of, as, uh, of the conjecture as a theorem. So we proved that for every theoretic graph on n vertices and for every x in this range, you can find um, a vertex subset of G containing exactly these x edges. And so, as I already said, a previous result of Alon Kivilevich and Sudakov proved this for the smaller initial range of axes. Okay, so that means when we want to prove this, we can now assume that x is at least n to the alpha c. 
So we can we use kind of the previous result of Alon Kivilevich and Sudakov to reduce, I mean, to, to only consider the case when X is not too, too small. So when X is at least n to the alpha C, because otherwise their result already covers this. Okay, so then, so then furthermore, um, we can restrict ourselves to an induced subgraph of G, right? Because if, if it is in that induced subgraph, we find that vertex subset and we have found the same vertex subset in the original graph. And so now I'm omitting some details here, but basically by doing such a restriction argument, we can restrict ourselves to the case that X is reasonably co close to the total number of ed edges over four. So the total number of edges of G as you know, is E of G. And so we may now assume that X is reasonably close to E of G over four. So again, I'm omitting the details, but basically the reason is if X is um, significantly smaller, then we can kick out some vertices of G and go to some induced subgraph. Okay, so now um, here's another piece of notation. So for vertex subset U, let E of U denote the number of edges in U. And so now what we need to show here is that G has a vertex subset U with E of U equals X, right? That's exactly what this says. So we find some vertex subset containing exactly X edges. That's our goal. Okay, but so in fact, the way we approach this, and that's why I'm talking about this in the probability and statistics seminar here, is that we use randomness to show this. So we show, in fact, that U, G has many such vertex subsets, U, or in other words, we show that if we consider a random vertex subset U of G, then we show that with a reasonable probability, it will have the property that E of U is X. Right, so basically, rather than explicitly constructing this vertex subset U, what we do is we consider a uniformly random vertex subset U of this graph G, and then we con um, give a reasonable lower bound uh, for the probability that E of U is X. So in fact, in order to establish this, it would just suffice to show that the probability of E of U being X is strictly positive. Um, but basically what we do is we study this probability of having E of U equals X. Okay, so here's again, just repeating what I just said. So for CRMZ graph G, we consider a random vertex subset U, and now we are interested in the distribution of this random variant E of U. So just again, G is given, so it's kind of like a given thing, but the randomness comes from the random vertex subset U. So we consider the random vertex subset and consider the number of edges inside it. And now we, that's a discrete random variable and we study the distribution of this. And so in particular, we, in, we are interested in the point probabilities of that random variable. So we're interested in the point probabilities that E of U is exactly X for some given number X. So this number E of U, I mean, has integer values, and we're interested in the exact probabilities of attaining every point. Uh, so, uh, so we are interested in the probabilities of attaining every point exactly for E of U being exactly equal to X. We're interested in estimating that probability. And in fact, we prove a result which, uh, which gives uh, pretty precise control of these point probabilities. So here's the result. It's a bit technical, so let me go through it slowly. So again, C is fixed. G is a C Ramsey graph on N vertices, where you think of N as very large. Now we consider a uniformly random vertex subset U. And so now um, the first part of our result gives an upper bound on these point probabilities, on these probabilities that the E of U is exactly equal to some X. So the first part of our result shows that for every x, the probability that e of u is exactly equal to x is at most some constant times n to the minus three halves. And then the second part gives a lower bound. So it shows that if x is reasonably close to e of g over four, so if x is not too far away from e of g over four, then the probability that e of u is exactly equal to x is at least a constant times n to the minus three halves. Okay, so basically, these upper and lower bounds for these point probabilities only differ by these constant factors. And so that means we, we now know that uh, the point probabilities are all, ex I mean, of order n to the minus three halves as long as x is not too far away from e of g over four. So not, uh, not too far away from a quarter of the total number of edges. So here's again the statement. Um, and so just to kind of comment on the term, terms a little bit more. So why does the E of G over four appear here? Well, if you think about it, so this random variable E of U, the expectation of this random variable is actually precisely E of G over four, right? Because every edge is gonna be within your random vertex subset with probability a fourth, right? Because both vertices of the edge have to be in. So the expectation of this random variable that we care about is E of G over four. And so what this says, if is X is reasonably close to the expectation, 
then we get this lower bound on point probabilities. And of course, you can expect a lower point bound on these point probabilities if you're far, very far away from the mean. If you're very far away from the mean, then you would uh, at least intuitively expect the point probabilities to be very small. Um, okay, but so in particular, what this shows that if X is reasonably close to E of G over four, then it's reasonably likely um, that E of U is X so that U contains exactly X edges. So we have this lower bound in the point probability. And so in particular, that, that then shows that the um, probability uh, of having E of U of X is positive, and therefore it shows what we need for the edge McK conjecture, namely that there exists some U that E of U is exactly equal to X. Um, yeah, and so uh, maybe just to comment some more about the other terms here. So why is there this n to the three halves here and here and here? Well, that's actually just the standard deviation of this random variable E of U that we care about. So the standard deviation is n to the three halves. And so basically what the result then shows is that if you go away a constant number of standard deviations from the mean, so say if you are within 10 standard deviations from the mean, then all point probabilities on the order one over the standard deviation. So within a kind of constant inter, I mean, say within 10 standard deviations, all point probabilities are of the same order. So they are kind of upper bounded by a constant times this and lower bounded by a constant times this. So basically what this says is if you go within a constant number of standard deviations on the mean, the probabilities only differ by constant factors from each other, the point probability. So there's no kind of exceedingly likely value, but there's also no value which is kind of exceedingly unlikely. Okay, um, any other questions? So if I heard right, this is very non-normal behavior. Um, yes, so um, we'll come back to that in a moment. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so, okay. so um, here's again the theorem. <clears throat> And so in fact, um, what we can deduce from, so we deduce this from this kind of uh, statement about the distribution of E of U and its point probabilities on the last slide. But in fact, we get something even stronger than what's written here. So what's written here is exactly resolving this conjecture of addition McKay. But in fact, we can prove something stronger. So um, in fact, so as I said before, if you have the statement where you um, hope to show that for every x in some reasonable range, you can find a vertex subset of G containing exactly x edges. You can't hope for this if x is more than the total number of edges of G, right? So, um, right, because I mean, you, that, that's at most the highest x you can ever get. Um, and you can't, can't expect it for every x up to E of G, right? Because for example, the total number of edges minus one you'll never be able to attain. But what we prove is actually that you can go almost up the way to E of G and, uh, for this range of X and still have the statement. So basically here, here's a more precise version of this. So let's C again be fixed, let G be a C Ramsey graph on N vertices where N is large with respect to C. Then for every integer X between zero and 0 0.99 times E of G, so up to 99% of the total number of edges, there is a vertex subset of G containing exactly X edges. So basically you can make this range here in the edge McKay conjecture, say up to 99% of the total number of edges. So you can reach up to, I mean, you, you can reach a, a nice complete interval where you really reach every X up to almost E of G. And so the number, uh, yeah. And so in particular, this statement is stronger than the statement above because we know that by this result of edge and that the total number E of G is at least some delta prime C times n squared. And so if you plug this in, this statement at the bottom is strictly stronger than the one at the top. And um, so the 0 0.99, there was not, nothing special about it in the statement at the bottom here. You could also write down the statement with any other constant instead of 0 0.99 with any other constant strictly less than one. That so, was my question. Yeah, so I just chose the 0 0.99 to not introduce yet another variable to make every, I guess, statements with too many parameters are hard to pass. But basically put your favorite fixed number here. And then how large n needs to be with respect, it depends on C and the number you put here. Okay, so um, unless there are any other questions, I wanna spend the remaining, uh, I guess around 20 minutes to tell you a little bit of the things that go into the proof of our, um, of our results. So basically um, the proof um, goes via this uh, distribution statement of this, uh, this random, you consider this random 
uh, vertex subs that you consider the distribution of E of U and its count probabilities. But so basically, so that, that's really the thing we need to show. And so for the rest of the talk, I wanna give you an overview um, of the proof of this. Um, but maybe let me first ask, are there any other questions? Yeah, yeah can you, you define the notation? There's this twiddle under the inequality sign. Yes, so yes, so I think on the previous slide I kind of wrote it out exactly. So what 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 we mean by the twiddle thing is up to constant factors. So the upper and the lower bound each have some constant factor, and the constant factor may depend here on C and here on C and A, where A quantifies how many standard deviations you are away from the mean or more formally, A is kind of, I guess, in this inequality quantifying how far away X is away from the mean. And so in everything that follows, writing a different constant in every line, I guess, creates a lot of mutation. So this twiddle just means up to constant factors, where the constant factors may depend on the index of ah. the thing. So okay, this means the up question. to a constant factor, which may depend on C, and this means up to a constant factor, which may depend on C and A. Thank you very much. Yeah. But so, so yeah, so that's the theorem we want to see. Um, yeah, and so for the rest of the talk, so uh, the proof is rather long, so I can't tell you the whole proof and all its details, but I just want to give you a glimpse of the different pieces which go into the proof. Okay, so um, yeah, so we already discussed that you, E of U has mean E of G over four on standard deviation on the order of n to the three halves up to constant factors, and that's why these three halves appear in these places in E of G over four. Um, and so what we need to show here in the statement is we need to uh, prove an upper bound for all of these point probabilities that E of U is equal to X. So for every X, we need to show an upper bound on this point probability. So we need to show that no value X is exceedingly likely attained by this random variable E of U. And then we also need to show a lower bound when X is close to the mean. So when X is close to E of U of four. So we need to show that every X, which is reasonably close to E of U of four is reasonably likely attained. So we need to show the upper and this lower point bounds on these point probabilities. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do. We have this fixed C, we have G to be a C Ramsey graph on N vertices for large N. So again, that means it doesn't have um, clicks or independent sets of size at C, at least C log two N. And so now this Ramsey graph G is given, and now we consider some randomness, namely we consider a uniformly random vertex, vertex subset, and we wanna prove upper and lower bounds for these point probabilities. Okay. So with relatively standard techniques, one can show that E of U satisfies the central limit theorem. So the random variable E of U that we care about um, on a large scale looks like a Gaussian random variable. So it looks roughly like this on a very large scale. Um, however, we need to study this um, random variable on a very fine scale. We, start, uh, we even care about every single individual point probabilities. Uh, point probability. And so basically the first question is then can the central limit theorem be strengthened to a local central limit theorem? So in other words, maybe more informally said, does this E of U also look locally like a Gauss? So on a large scale after normalizing correctly, it looks roughly like this, but it does it also look like this when we zoom in and we look at the individual points. So, okay, so here's again the setup. We have the serum Z graph G, we uh, the random vertex subset U, we study this random variable E of U, the number of edges in U, um, and we want to prove upper and lower bounds for this point probabilities. But unfortunately, such a local central limit theorem does not always hold. So it is possible, and this, I mean, indeed, this can happen for certain examples of C Ramsey graphs, that um, rather than Gaussian, the distribution of E of U can look like this. So you see again that on a large scale, this roughly looks like a Gaussian, but this Gaussian is somehow interlaid with these with these um, finer perturbations. So with these smaller Gaussian-like curves. So the large scale behavior is Gaussian as kind of, I guess, already we know from the central limit theorem, but on the small scale, we see these smaller Gaussian-like curves in this picture. And this can actually happen. And so this means that uh, Fourier analysis methods, which were previously um, developed to prove a local central limit theorems in other combinatorial settings can't be enough here. So basically there were some some other papers which prove local central limit theorems in for, for various other somewhat related looking combinatorial problems, but just doing what they do cannot work here because basically the local central limit theorem is just not true. And so that means we need some more intricate arguments which, um, which are based on the interplay of physical space um, and Fourier space and we can't just study the Fourier coefficients alone. Okay. 
And so just because this behavior looks so crazy and you might now say, well, this looks unlikely to actually really ever happen. Let me show you some real data showing that this actually can happen. So these are histograms from the distribution from real data. So how is this real data generated, right? I told you that there are no explicit examples known of C. Ramsey graphs, but basically how this is generated is G is taken as an outcome of a random graph. So if you take some large number of vertices, you sample for every edge independently random whether you want to take it. So that way you norm, I mean, you typically expect to get a reasonably typical outcome of a random graph. So it's going to be very likely a C. Ramsey graph. And then from you now you fix that G and from that you now take many, many samples of random vertex subsets. So I think this data was generated with maybe 2 million samples of uh, vertex subsets U. And so then you make a plot of how many edges, how, how often does it happen that every edge number is attained? So basically the horizontal axis is the number of, X, uh, of edges and the, the, um, the vertical axis plots how likely that is. So basically how many of your random samples had exactly this number of edges. So that's this diagram. And so on the, on the left side here, as you see again, this nice, I mean, this like, overall on large scale it's Gaussian, but then you already see that these kind of weird ups and downs and some really nicely behaved like the Gaussian. And then when you zoom in more, you actually really these, see these smaller triggers. So this picture on the right is zoomed in and this picture on the left. And so you see really there are these, these wiggles going on, yeah. When you zoomed in, did you tilt? Sorry, what? When you zoomed in, did you tilt? Um, I'm not sure. I didn't make the picture, actually. Okay. Um, so, um, but my understanding is, so this is not, I don't think this is really zoomed in from this picture, right? I mean, this picture doesn't have enough pixels to zoom in, but I mean, I guess this random experiment was run on a computer and then you know out of your 2 million samples, how often did any particular um, value of edges, uh, number of edges occur. And so then from that data, there were these two different pictures made over different intervals of the total number of edges. So this is basically the whole interval that we say the last year behavior, and this is some smaller sub interval. Is the picture from your paper or custom made for the purposes of presenting a talk? Uh, it's from the paper. It'd be nice if they have an explanation of exactly what's being graphed on the right. Um, yeah, so you mean which interval of edges this is? Yeah, and is there any tilting or other post processing going on? Yeah, um, that's a good point. I'll, um, I'll bring this up and maybe in the next revision we can then put, we, we should put that, you're right. Okay. What, is the, what is the spacing between the peaks roughly in the, in the picture on the right? Is it like 20? It looks like about 20 or something if I'm counting the, the bumps. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, um, so we we'll get to that in a moment, but you expect these peaks to be roughly square root n away from each other. Okay. Um, so now I don't know how big the graph was, so I don't remember. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, but yeah, so, so basically all I'm trying to say with these pictures was that um, this isn't kind of just imaginary thing, this can actually happen. Um, but in fact, this kind of weird two scale thing can only happen if the vertex degree sequence of the graph G is additively structured in a certain sense. So basically, there's a dichotomy here saying that um, this weird thing, which means that, Fourier, that this Fourier analysis method um, can't succeed alone or kind of get much harder. So this weird thing, this weird two-scale behavior can only happen if there's additive structure in the degree sequence of the graph. So if you look at all the vertex degrees, that's a sequence of numbers. And if there's, in a certain sense, additive structure in these numbers, only in that case can it happen that this, that this, this picture, this two-scale behavior appears. But if you have this additive structure, then we can also use this additive structure in our proof. So we can utilize that additive structure for other arguments. And so in the other case of the dichotomy where the degree sequence is not additively structured, that case is actually easier because then basically one can show just the Fourier analytic methods and that E of U behaves like a Gaussian even on very small scales. So basically in that case, when there's not this additive structure, this two scale thing also doesn't happen. Okay, so maybe let me 
Um, because this two scale behavior is really kind of strange and maybe very surprising at first, let me give you a heuristic why this can happen. So this, the, the following heuristic is supposed to maybe make it a bit more plausible to you why this is not as shocking as it looks at first. So here is um, a way to write E of U as a polynomial. Um, so a priori, this doesn't look very useful, but you see in a moment why this is useful. So this polynomial is in the characteristic vector of this um, random subset U. So remember U was a random subset of E of G and we can um, encode the subset by this characteristic vector zero one, and the zero one vector, which has ones for the vertices that are part of U and zeros for the other vertices. And then if you kind of define, I guess, the coordinates of this characteristic vector Xi that way, we can write E of U as the sum over all edges V W of the original graph of Xi V times Xi W. So that basically just tautologically calculates that this is the total number of edges in U because only the vertices in U will contribute positive terms here. Okay, so, so that so far um, is pretty tautological, but not really yet insightful in order to understand the two-scale behavior. But now let's instead do something different. Instead of taking this ordinary zero one characteristic vector, let's consider the say plus one minus one characteristic vector of the set U. So rather than encoding the vertices and non-vertices as the vertices inside and outside U by zeros and one, let's, um, let's encode them by ones and negative ones. So basically we take this vector Psi that we defined here and replace all zeros by minus one. So then we get another back, I mean, basically again, a version of the characteristic vector now just with plus ones and minus ones. And the two versions are related by this easy formula. So if we replace all zeros here by minus ones, then we will afterwards have that psi v is x v plus one divided by two. Okay, and so now um, maybe you can't check the details right away on the slide, but basically you can maybe just believe me that if we take this relationship between psi v and x v and plug this in here, then this polynomial expression here will become significantly more complicated, but you can, I guess, plug this all in and multiply it out, and then you get this. Okay, so maybe this is too fast to check the details, but basically you can just trust me that this is some sort of computation. And so basically what you then have is that the number of edges of U is some constant term, namely E of G over four. So that's a constant not depending on this random subset U plus something which depends linearly on this vector X. So it's a linear function of the entries of X. So it depends linearly on which vertices are in this random subset U plus some quadratic function of this X. Okay, so this thing is a linear function, this thing is a quadratic function x. And so now you can make the following observations. Then we this linear part. This linear function here has variance on the order of n cubed because these degrees are typically on the order of n. And so this function has variance of the of order n, n cubed. But the variance of this quadratic part is smaller. It's only on of order n squared. And so, um, so that means that the, um, the linear part here dominates the large scale behavior of E of U, whereas the quadratic part basically leads to a smaller variance. Um, and so now let's consider the special case, just to, I mean, because it's heuristically interesting to look at this, let's consider a uh, special case where the vertex degrees are all exactly N over two for all vertices. So that means all these coefficients here will be exactly N over two. So a priori, it's maybe not clear that there are random graphs that our vertex degrees are exactly n over two, but you maybe you can just believe me that one can show that there exist CRMC graphs with this property, that all degrees are n over two. And so if we are in this case, then this linear part only takes integer multiples of n over eight as values. So basically the value of this linear part will always be an integer value of n over eight. And so that means that the peaks in this, um, this two-scale behavior. Uh, sorry, so that means that this linear part is only takes discrete values which are n over eight apart. And so this then corresponds to these peaks in this two-scale behavior, which are n over eight apart, um, whereas this quadratic part then leads to smaller wiggles around them. Okay, um, yeah. So this is supposed to give you a heuristic how this can happen. So basically the linear parts this, the value, possible values of the linear part at the different smaller peaks, and then there are these figures around it coming from this quadratic part. Okay, so here's again the picture. We have these smaller figures. Okay, but so um, 
so this phenomen phenomenon can, so we just, I guess, saw some heuristic of this phenomenon happening if the vertex degrees are all exactly n over two, but it can actually happen more generally if the degree sequence is um, additively structured in a certain sense. And to capture this precise, I mean, to, I guess, make this precise, what we mean by additively structured, we use the notion of regularized least common denominator, which was introduced by version and, and random matrix theory originally. And so using this, I mean, I don't wanna, don't have time to go into the details here, but using this notion of um, regularized least common denominator, we uh, kind of, I guess, make precise what we mean by additively structured, and then we can formally um, kind of, I guess, define this dichotomy of being either additively structured or not additively structured. And so in this additively structured case, where the degree sequence has this additive structure, then we can use this additive structure to find a partition of the vertex set of G into a small number of buckets, so basically subsets. So we partition these vertices of, into subsets, which we call, which we think of, say, buckets. So the vertices in the same bucket have similar degrees in the graph G. So basically, because of this additive structure, additive structure properties of the degree sequence, we will be able to divide up the vertices into a small number of groups, which we each think of living in some sort of bucket, uh, so that the vertices in the same bucket have uh, similar degrees, so the degrees are not too far apart in the same bucket. And so then in the proof, what we do is we analyze the distribution of this random variable that we care about, conditioned on the intersection sizes of this random set U with each bucket, right? U was a uniformly random vertex subset, so it is gonna have a certain intersection size with each of the buckets in this partition, and conditioning on this information, so conditioning on these intersection sizes, we then analyze the distribution of this E of U. And so basically, in some sense, that corresponds to uh, the zooming in and studying the peaks and the two-scale behavior, because these peaks basically correspond on the information of how U intersects with these buckets. Um, and so in this picture, it now looks that these individual peaks, which we study, look like smaller Gaussians. But in fact, they are not smaller Gaussians. So in fact, if after conditioning on the intersection sizes of this random set U with these buckets, the distribution of E of U may look like this. So as you see, this is not a Gaussian looking thing. This is some sort of skew thing. And this is again, so this is, this is just a, I don't know, um, cartoon-like picture, but this is again, a real data picture. So it can really be some sort of skew thing. Okay, so that means that rather than a gauss, so that this means these individual peaks, so this kind of, the or in other words, the distribution of U after this conditioning is not Gaussian-like. So instead, this distribution turns out to be a quadratic polynomial of independent Gaussian variables. So the distribution you can check, um, and if you can describe at least in the limiting behavior, um, like a quadratic polynomial of independent Gaussians. And so that means in order to then get our desired from conclusions, we need some, some tools or some lemmas about small ball probabilities of quadratic polynomials of independent Gaussians. So that means uh, in, in our paper, there's actually a whole section which has nothing to do with random graphs and so on and the whole other setup. It's just about studying small ball probabilities of quadratic polynomials of independent Gaussians. And so in order, so there are some, some, some theorems about this, but um, but not of the type that we need. So because we need uh, sort of better anti-concentration probabilities for these Gaussians under the additional assumption that the quadratic form has, uh, the quadratic form underlying this quadratic polynomial has robustly high rank. So this high rank assumption is necessary in order to get the sort of good anti-concentration bounds. So these good small ball probability bounds that we need. Um, but that means in order to then apply these lemmas that we develop and prove there, um, we need, when we want to apply them, we need to actually check this high rank assumption. So that means we also need to prove that um, the adjacency matrix of a Randy graph, which basically, this is where this polynomial then comes from, from this adjacency matrix, satisfies these robust high rank assumptions. So we also prove a bunch of lemmas about adjacency matrices of Randy graphs. And so, um, then for the Fourier analytic part of our proof, which I also don't have time to go into detail about, but I just want to mention that um, uses also, I mean, that part is also highly non-trivial and uses kind of decoupling and other techniques, including also some combinatorial arguments to study different types of can cancellations in Fourier analytic expressions. So basically that this different range of Fourier um, coefficients and a different range of, and a different, I mean, a different ranges for, uh, 
but for the, um, we need to study different types of cancellations in the Fourier analytic expressions that are relevant for us. So basically in different regimes, different types of cancellations drive the behavior of these Fourier analytic coefficients. Okay, so using all of these tools, which I just kind of, I guess, uh, mentioned briefly, I gave you a list, laundry list of, so using this, this kind of list of tools mentioned on the previous slides, we can then analyze the probability of E of U lying in a constant length interval. So both in the additively structured case and in the additively unstructured case, which is easier. So basically by doing this, you can analyze pretty well the probability of E of U lying in a constant length interval, but that's not quite enough. Right, because we were interested in point probabilities. So we wanted to get upper and lower bounds for the probabilities of U, E of U being exactly equal to one particular value of X and not just in some constant length interval. And so now for the upper bound part, that's not a problem, right? Because the probability of E of U being exactly equal to X is at most the probability of lying in some constant length interval around X. But for the lower bound, that's a problem, right? If I just know with a reasonable probability, I'm in the short interval, it doesn't tell me that every particular point in the interval is attained with a good probability. And so to fix that problem, um, we need some more arguments. So um, to get this lower, this desired lower bound, we use what's called the switching methods where we study um, small perturbations to this random set U where we switch one vertex against another and uh, study the impact of those via some combinatorial arguments. Um, and so um, let me just mention that the usual way you do the switching method doesn't really work here. So we introduce a novel average version of the switching method, which basically studies moments of certain moments of the number of ways to switch in order to then get the desired lower bounds for these point probabilities rather than these, just these constant length interval probabilities. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. Um, and thank you for coming into attention. Thank you.